Welcome to Hope Church. If we've not had a chance to meet, my name's Jason Rumbo. I'm the teaching pastor here. And uh, whether you are joining us uh, masked in the room or you are watching us in the comfort of your stretchy pants online, thank you for being here. We are so glad that you are with us today, spending these moments. I really believe God has something specific and very special that he wants to communicate to us this morning. We are going to be in Psalm chapter 1. If you're not familiar with Psalm, where Psalm is, uh, basically open up your Bible to the very middle and then you're probably right around where you need to be, okay? So Psalm chapter 1. I have a friend named Chris who is deeply in love with Star Wars. Now, when I say deeply in love, I don't mean that he enjoys it. Uh, I mean that he is the guy who knows everything there is to know about Star Wars. He's the guy who, he's at the theater on the night of the premiere, three hours before the doors open, dressed as Obi-Wan Kenobi with his, like, replica lightsaber, like, ready to go, right? And I, I watched, watched a few movies, um, Star Wars. Actually, I think I've watched all of them. And I like them. Like, I like the action. Uh, I like the, the suspense. I like the plot lines. But watching it at home in my pajamas with a bag of Twizzlers is vastly different than watching it in the theater with my friend Chris, who knows everything about all the movies, all the graphic novels, all the TV show spinoffs. This guy is the guy who he goes onto like the dark web and researches like all the conspiracies behind Star Wars. Like he is in the zone. And so watching a movie with him is vastly different because every time I watch it with him, I learned something about the Star Wars universe that I did not previously know. I remember one time we were watching one of the movies together and this guy who just seemed like a random dude died. And my friend Chris actually started crying. And I couldn't figure out what, it, what the deal was, so I just kind of casually made the comment. I was like, dude, he's an extra. Like, it happens. It's going to be okay. To which he replied, no. The color of his uniform linked him to this random rebel base that was insurmountable and overthrowing the empire's reach and grasp in that quadrant of the universe. This is truly a dark day. And I looked at him and I was like, I'm sorry for your loss. You know, like, what do you say in those kind of moments? Now, you may not be a Star Wars fanatic, but all of us have a movie or a TV show or a book or a piece of music that we would say that we know fairly well. And every time we go back to it and listen to it, or watch it, or pick it up again, we discover new things that maybe were previously hidden to us before. Reading the Bible is the same exact way. If we approach the Bible as purely literal, as a one-size-fits-all manual for science, or for politics, or for life in the modern world, we will miss what the Bible is truly trying to say to us and do to us on a profoundly deep, deeper level. Now, the Bible does give us some things to live by, right? But the design and the goal is not to do it by a copy and paste methodology. Instead, what the Bible wants us to do is it wants to interact with us as we interact with it through a long marathon-like training process that we at Hope here called spiritual formation. So with that said, we're going to look at Psalm chapter 1 and how this text in particular helps us in that process of spiritual formation. But would you do me a favor? We're going to stand together and read Psalm chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, great. If not, it'll be on the screen behind me. But let's just honor God with our bodies as we stand together and read this. It says this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take. Or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor stand in the sinner, no, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. But the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This is the word of the Lord. You may have a seat. Now, right out of the gate, this psalm has a very odd 
way to start. It, it says basically, how fortunate or blessed, or your translation may say, happy is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Now, when we hear that word blessed, a lot of different things come flooding into our mind. And usually they revolve around something amazing that happens to somebody with seemingly little effort on their own. I read this week a story about this 81-year-old Rhode Island lady whose name was Louise White, who won $336 million playing the lottery. One of the news reporters was, was interviewing her, and they said, Miss White, like, what do you have to say to this? And she said, and I quote, I'm very happy, very proud, and very blessed. Now, nobody would argue that Miss White is very fortunate, but the word blessed, at least in the way that the psalmist use it, uses it, has a vastly different meaning. The idea or the phrase blessed here in this text is actually based on an ancient Hebrew idea that we really don't have much of an equivalent to in our English language. The closest thing that we have to it is the word congratulations or way to go. Think about it like this. When somebody has a baby or they get a new job, what do you say? Congratulations. Like, fantastic. Way to go. Why? Because they worked hard and now they are reaping the benefits of their toil. It was something that happened not out of luck, but out of a great deal of effort over an extended period of time. This is essentially what the psalmist is getting at. He says, congratulations are in order to the one who doesn't walk, sit, or stand in the company of the wicked, or as some scholars translate it, the empty talkers. Why? Because the writer knows, listen, that avoiding the company of those who are empty talkers who literally have nothing of value to say, takes a lot of work, right? I mean, we all get caught up from time to time in in conversations that have really little to no value. I think this is a lot of what social media is, right? Social media gives somebody who has really nothing of value to say a platform to say it to those of us who really don't care or those of us who care too much, right? The psalmist says here that the blessed one is the one who works hard to not just avoid being empty talker, but also to push against the temptation to allow empty talkers to drag you down with them. But notice that the blessed one in this text doesn't just avoid something. They're actually committed to something, two things, in fact. The first is this, they delight in the law of the Lord. They delight in the law of the Lord. That word delight, it's kind of a Shakespearean term at times. We don't really go around talking about how I'm delighted by you or by an individual. But it's actually a Hebrew word that means to love or cherish. It's the same word that you would use to describe a couple that are married and have been married for decades. It's that sense of delight they have with one another. It's not infatuation, it's intimacy. This is love that that comes by only through walking of seasons of heartache, of loneliness, sometimes boredom, and tragedy with another person and still remaining faithful, steadfast, and immovable year after year. But but notice that the, uh, the psalmist says that this delight is not an intimacy with another person. It's kind of strange. He says it's intimacy with the law of the Lord. That word law is actually a word that um, in different translations could mean to use the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. It could mean to use the teaching of an elder or a priest or a prophet or maybe the teachings of Moses. Or in this situation, it means the entirety of Scripture. So kind of as a summary, here's what the psalmist is saying. He's saying essentially that the blessed one is the person who has an intimate relationship with the ways of God as found in Scripture. Now, right out of the gate, I want to address a common problem that I think many, maybe many in here, I don't know, have when it comes to this idea of delighting in the law of God. Sometimes what happens is we are so familiar with a text or the cultural hurdles are so big when we read the text or, let's just be honest, the names are so hard to pronounce that we approach the scriptures with a type of cynicism or skepticism. 
or even boredom, that it clouds our ability to delight in it while we're reading. Now, if that's you, listen, I get it. I mean, we were going through, we're going through the book of Genesis right now as a church, and this past, well, last week, week before last, I was reading through the, the text on Esau's descendants, and I fell asleep twice. So you're in good company, right? But I think what happens in these moments when we become overfamiliar or overwhelmed is that we forget what Paul tells us about Scripture in 2 Timothy. And it is God breathed. It is literally breathed out by God. Now think about a marriage for a second. If on your wedding day you stand in front of the pastor and he asks you why you want to get married and you respond, well, I have to. The next question he's going to follow up is, why are you getting married? I mean, if you're going into this with obligation or whatever, like, why even do it? I mean, those of us who have been married longer than five minutes know that it's not all sunshine and rainbows, right? <laughs> Matter of fact, there are some days when being married is harder than not being married. However, if we go into marriage with the expectation that we are not going to get anything of value or delight from it, then that will be exactly what happens. It will, in a sense, become a self-fulfilling prophecy. One friend of mine this past week put it this way. I love it. He says, oftentimes we place onto the Bible an expectation that we do not place on anything else in life. This morning, I got up, had a cup of coffee, and I ate a bagel with butter on it. And it was okay. It was not the best bagel I've ever had. Matter of fact, I think it was one of those knockoff brands. It just wasn't really that great at all. But I ate it. Every time I eat breakfast, I don't sit down and think, this is it. This is going to be the best breakfast I've ever had, right? I've started taking up running. It's not going well. Every day I go out, I don't think this is going to be the best run ever. Usually I think, not again, <laughs> you know? It's hard. Now, sometimes we have a meal, a breakfast, or we go for an exercise or a run, and it is epic. But that's not every time. The joy and the pleasure of those things come from simply developing the routine and the habit of coming back again and again and over time seeing progressive movement. Now, if this is you and you find yourself feeling overly familiar or overwhelmed by the text, let me just encourage you to do, do a few things. One, just pause. Just push pause for a second. And just pray and say, God, I, I'm struggling right now. Just to be honest, I'm struggling through this. Holy Spirit, open my eyes, open my mind, and help me see what you want to say to me. And then challenge yourself to think of the scripture less as a textbook and more like a love letter from a friend or a spouse. But notice next what happens with this delight. Notice, notice what the, the delighted person does. It says this secondly, that they meditate on it day and night. Meditation is a word that I think sometimes has a little bit of a, a baggage associated with it, especially in our Western context. Sometimes we think of yoga or maybe you think of, I've got an app on my phone that helps me with breathing exercises called the Calm app. Like sometimes you think of, of those things, but that's actually not the word that's used here. A better sense of what the, the psalmist is trying to get at with, with meditation would be our word, marination. Now, for a marinade to be truly effective, it needs two things, time and exposure. And the longer something like a piece of meat or a pot of soup sits in a marinade, the more that marinade and the flavor of that marinade it seeps into every part of the thing that is marinating. Now, here, here's, here's the truth in all this. All of us are already in the process of marinating in something. Your mind is already filled with repetitive thoughts that you spend time ruminating over. Maybe it's a conversation with somebody at work or a family member. Maybe it was something, a decision that you made that you're like, ah, I shouldn't have done that or I should have done it sooner or, or better. And maybe there's something else that's constantly on your mind that's the, the last thing you think about before you go to sleep and the first thing that you think about when you wake up in the morning. I think that sometimes, a lot, or a lot of times really, the, the things that we think about are, 
our, uh, that consume our thoughts are either regrets that we have about decisions that we made or they're anxious thoughts about things that we cannot control at all. And ultimately, what happens? I mean, this doesn't lead to anywhere good. All right, a lot of times as we're ruminating over these things, we feel ourselves getting anxious, stressed, worried. Right? It kind of leads, which affects our sleep, our physical health. We kind of go down this rabbit hole where eventually we're just struggling to get out of bed. You've often heard me say that what you give your attention to is ultimately what you become. For example, if you give your attention or if your attention is consumed with worry, you eventually become with a need to control the environment and the other people around you. If your attention is consumed with other people's opinions of you, you eventually become an insecure and lonely person. If your attention is consumed with holding on to the people and stuff in your life at all costs, you will eventually become a bitter person who is trapped in a prison of fear and loss. And the Bible knows us about us. It knows that we have this, t- this tendency to marinate or, or to meditate on these things. And so what it does is it offers a vastly different solution, and it's the meditation on Scripture. Because this doesn't lead to death, it leads to life. It doesn't lead to stress and anxiety, it leads to joy and blessing. And in the words of Psalm 1, success as we hear from God and we learn to apply his words to our life. In a sense, Psalm 1 is the Bible's way of describing the ideal reader, somebody who loves to read it, who reads it carefully, thoughtfully, with ongoing consideration, and who has a relationship with God's word rather than using it for a spiritual quickie. Now, what's interesting is that as you read the Bible, it actually tries to force you into this posture. I mean, over and over again. I mean, sometimes when reading some of the stories of the text, the author doesn't come right out and say, okay, here's the lesson, right? Sometimes we have to just spend time thinking over it. What does this mean? What does this have to do with me? Why? Here's why. Because the Bible anticipates that we are going to interact with it over the course of a lifetime, coming back again and again, not just moving on to the next thing. That's the expectation of the Bible, and that should be our expectation too. So here's what I want to do. I want to spend the remainder of our time talking about how we actually do this. I mean, how do we develop this sort of posture? And I want to talk about technique. Now, for some of us, the question is this. Where do I start? I mean, last week we talked about how the Bible is a library of books, different genres, different motives, like all kinds of things. Like, where, where should we start? The second question that people often have is this. When I figure out where to start, what do I do when I get there? I mean, what questions am I supposed to ask? What things should I write down? What translation am I supposed to use? When I was a kid, I remember oftentimes being challenged to have a quiet time. What was interesting was I was never really sure what to do during the quiet time. So I would spend my time trying to figure out how to actually spend my time and never actually spend my time reading the Bible, right? Ever, ever happened to any of you guys? Now, that said, there are a lot of different ways to approach it. Some of us can, can just read it like we're using our, our Bible reading plan as a church and kind of go through it. Some of us use like a, a Bible study to go through it. Some of us use a, like a commentary to read along with it or to use kind of like a lesson of sorts. And, and all of those are great. If you have something that you already use, I don't want to discourage you from that. But what I found a lot of times is people fail to read the Bible because they fail to have a plan on how they're going to read the Bible. So what I want to do is I want to give you this plan. It's something that actually was a method that the church has used for centuries. And it's personally what I do just about every morning when I wake up. And I believe in this method so much. Listen, that we're going to spend two weeks on this. This week we're going to talk about the how, the what it looks like. And next week we're actually going to walk through an example of how to unpack this in our daily lives. And it's something called the Lectio Divina. The Lectio Divina. And it, the Lectio Divina comes from three, from, excuse me, from the third century where a group of monks got together and were like, hey, we need to spend some time actually working through this text and apply it to our lives. It's, it's a study, but not in the academic sense. It's a study in the sense of it is a meeting with God himself in the scriptures. And it has five parts to it you can see on the screen behind me. 
The first is this, it's rest, excuse me, it's retreat. The second is read. The third is reflect. The fourth is respond. And the fifth is rest. Now what I want to do is I want to unpack each of these briefly over the next few minutes. The first thing that the Lectio Divina asks us to do is to retreat. This basically just means it's a preparation to meet with God. So when you're in this, this stage, this step, find a quiet place. Get comfortable, but not where you're going to fall asleep. Turn off your phone. Get your Bible ready. Get your cup of coffee or whatever you need to just be in that moment. Just about every morning, I get up around 5 a.m. And this is what I do. I cut my alarm off. I stumble to the kitchen where I get my cup of coffee. I stumble into the living room. Cut the light on and I sit in my chair. You know what I'm talking about? And I just simply sit and pray and go, all right, Holy Spirit, I'm here. I'm here. Teach me what you want to say to me in this moment. Sometimes I spend about an hour. Sometimes more, sometimes less. I've just discovered for me it takes me about an hour to be able to actually be in the frame of mind by the end to where I feel like I've actually met with the creator of the universe. You may be more, you, you may be less. But I don't cut my phone on. I don't check email, I don't check social media, I don't cut the news on, I just simply take a few deep breaths to wake up, and I pray, ask the Holy Spirit to speak, and then I begin to read. Now for you, you may choose to do this at 5 a.m. I know a lot of people are not early morning risers, and that's okay. Uh, You may do this before you go to bed, you may do this on your lunch break. The important part is not the time of day, but the time that you spend. Let me say it again. The important part is not the time of day. It's the time that you spend in these moments. After you kind of get to that space where you've retreated or kind of pulled away, the next thing is you read. You read slowly. You read carefully. And get this, listen. You read out loud. That may feel, make you feel a little self-conscious. That's okay. But classic meditation literature, like the Bible, was designed to be read out loud. It it slows the process down, and it channels our focus. Studies in in neurology actually show that when we read things out loud, our cognitive functions in every other area of our life begins to increase. Not only that, it helps us with our overall memory retention. So listen, don't rush. Take your time. Now, if you're not sure what to read, let me encourage you, you can start in the Psalms like we did with Psalm 1. You can start with one of the stories of Jesus. You can use our Bible reading plan that we've got as a church. If you're new to reading the Bible, I love this, like find somebody and ask them, hey, what what is your favorite book? What, What do you like to read? And that helps you, one, because it gives you a place to start. And two, if and when you have questions, you know who to bug. Hey, I, I, you told me to read this. Now I'm stuck. What do I do? What does it mean? Right? It gives you an opportunity to have a conversation. Wherever you choose to start, listen, as you move through the text, pay attention to words or phrases that jump off the page and draw your attention in in unique ways. If something kind of stands out to you, just pause. Don't rush through it. Turn it over in your mind. Write it down. Circle it. Highlight it. Underline it. Whatever. But just kind of begin to think through it. And then when you get to the end of the passage, just pause and move on to the next thing, which is step three, reflect. Reflect. Once you've read the chapter, ready? Go back and read it again. How many of you have ever watched a movie or listened to a piece of music and you listen to it and you're like, that was really good. And the next time you go back, you're like, whoa, I didn't didn't catch that plot line before, right? I didn't see that character before. I didn't hear that melody before. That ever happened to you? It happens to me a lot. The same thing happens when we read the text. When we go back, we go, oh, oh my gosh, I, I didn't catch that before. I didn't see that earlier. As you're doing this, think through questions like, what do, I, what do I need to know? Or what do I need to do in light of this text? What does this mean for my life today? What issues does it seem to be addressing that, that are kind of similar to issues I'm going through in my own life? Or... Is there an attitude or an action that this text addresses that needs to change in my own life? As you're going through it, 
Read it personally. Read it individually. Now, y'all, not every text is going to have something that jumps right out. I mean, there are going to be some times that you're going to read a text, and it won't be until later on the day, maybe a couple days later, maybe even months down the road that you're like, now I get it, right? Light bulb goes off, and it begins to make sense. And sometimes you stare at the text, and it makes no sense at all. And sometimes you stare at the text, and you're like, that's great. Listen, regardless, that's okay. That is okay. I think this is exactly what the psalmist is getting at in this this passage where he says that the one who delights in the law of God is like a tree planted by streams of water who yield its fruit in its season. Have you ever seen a tree that was newly planted or or maybe it's just kind of like a sapling? It does not produce fruit the first year. Matter of fact, sometimes it takes a while for it to grow fruit. When that happens, you don't go out and dig up the tree or cut it down and go, ah, forget it, I'm done. No, you wait. You give it patience. You give it grace. You, you maybe bring in an, an expert or somebody else to help you take care of it and, and figure out what the problem may be. You give it grace. Listen, if you read the text and you're confused or you don't get the point, that's okay. Give yourself grace. Give yourself time. Give yourself patience. Success in reading the Bible is not necessarily walking away with an incredible insight or having felt like the sky opened and an angel spoke to you. Y'all, if that's success, most of my time in the Word has been a massive failure. That's not the goal. Success is this, coming back day after day in the same humble posture of, God, I'm here. I'm here. Teach me. Speak. Let me give you a little secret. Actually, probably not a secret because I'm telling you, but here you go, right? God does not speak to me any more than he can or wants to speak to you. Let me just say that. God does not speak to me any more than he can or wants to speak to you. Just because I'm a pastor does not mean that I have some sort of inside scoop or private line that's only available to those who've gone to seminary. In fact, some of the most godly people I know, ones that God has spoken to in large, monumental ways are people who have never gone to seminary, they've never been on staff at a church, and they've never been a, quote, professional Christian. They're simply men and women who are apprentices of Jesus who have said, Lord, I'm here and I'm listening. I love what Richard Foster says in his book, Celebration of Discipline, on writing on the practice of meditation. He's talking about people throughout the Bible who have heard from God, and he says it this way. These were people who were close to the heart of God. God spoke to them, get this, not because they had special abilities, but because they were willing to listen. Christian meditation, very simply, is the ability to hear God's voice and obey his word. When you and I are finally in a place where, as Foster put it, we are willing to listen, then, and only then, are we ready to move on to the next step. We've got to have this humble posture. We've got to be willing to listen and then apply before we move to step four, which is respond. Here at Hope, we've called this the practice of contemplation or meditation or mindfulness. And y'all, truth be told, this is the practice or this is the step that I think most people skip. I'm not sure why. I don't know if it's because it's uncomfortable or because you're like, I'm in a hurry. I got to get to the next thing. But this step right here, I would say, is probably one of the most important steps in the Lectio Divina. And I would argue the most important step when it comes to your formation as an apprentice of Jesus. You cannot skip this step. Here's how it works. Ready? After you read the text... Talk to God about it. That's it. You read it, and then you talk to God about it. And y'all, it doesn't have to be pretty. There are a lot of times when I get to this step, it feels messy. It feels disorganized. It feels even emotional as I'm working through what God is revealing to me in the Scripture. And sometimes I don't like it. It can be uncomfortable. Y'all, sometimes I'll read a text, and I'll just get mad. Or sad. 
And oh my God, I don't, why did you say it like this? God, I don't understand this part. Lord, this hurts my soul. Help me understand this. And y'all, if that's you, that's okay. That is okay. The point is not to get all of our spiritual ducks in a row. The point is to respond to the things that the Holy Spirit is bringing to the surface of our heart and our mind. If you're confused, say that. If you're upset, tell God you're upset and why. If you are compelled to worship, worship. If the text brought something else to mind, tell God that too. The Lectio Divina, get this, is designed to foster intimacy between you and the creator of the universe. And we are all, y'all, we are all messy creatures. All of us. And so it's okay if this process reveals the messiness that is already a reality in your life. That is okay. After you've gotten to this point and you respond, you move into the last step, which is simply rest. The temptation many times is to kind of finish with step four. I read it. I prayed. I responded. It was good. Then we pack up and we head on to the next thing, right? We got checklists to do. We got emails to respond to. Facebook isn't going to post to itself, right? We got to do this thing. But let me just encourage you, after spending a moment reading and reflecting, just spend some time sitting still in the presence of God. Just being in his presence. Whatever you're feeling after having read scripture, give yourself some time to just feel that in the presence of God. You may cry. That's okay. You may sing. That's great. You may laugh. But do me and do yourself a favor and don't skip this step because, y'all, this right here is how we learn to delight in and marinate in Scripture. That's how we learn this. It could be a few minutes. It could be half an hour. It's, it doesn't really matter. It, the point is not how long it is. The point is to simply do it and be committed to it. Now, a lot of times uh, we can get frustrated with the Bible, and I see it often. I think it's because when we go through this process, we read something and the Bible doesn't end up telling us something that we want it to tell us, and it doesn't do what we want it to do. If you're looking for sorry, the answer to certain theological questions, like did Adam and Eve ride dinosaurs, or a personal issue, like what job should I take, or well, who should I marry, then you're going to be very frustrated very quickly. Now, and I understand that frustration, but at the same time, I think it's largely unfair because when we approach the Bible with those lenses, we are trying to make it do something that it was never intended to do. Here's an example. My family and I love to watch The Great British Baking Show. Don't judge, okay? It's a great show. We love the whole thing, man. We, we love to watch them underneath that white tent trying to get all those ingredients together and watch you know, the, how the, the heat and the cool and the acidity and all this kind of stuff come together to make this incredible thing that they're under a time constraint to get happen. It's amazing and everybody in my family loves it except for one who shall remain nameless. And I asked him, dude, why don't you like this show? He said, oh, it's very simple. Lightsabers. I was like, Lightsaber? Like, what, what, what do you mean? Here's what they said. You see, there's simply no action. There's no plot. No rebel alliance coming to take over the Great British Baking Show. Now, if the bakers were suddenly overrun by a band of rogue ninjas fighting on behalf of the Empire and then defeated by a lightsaber-wielding sous chef, then I would watch. But for now, I'm just going to stick to Fortnite and the Mandalorian. <laughs> now, y'all, I can, t I, ha I have to admit, like, that sounds pretty good, right? I mean, I would love to watch that kind of show too. But to get frustrated, disappointed, or maybe even angry at the producers of the Great British Baking Show because Baby Yoda doesn't show up, it's not fair. Because that's not the point of the show. That's not the point. But so many times, this is how we approach the Bible. We read the Bible with the goal of finding a quick verse or two about how to fix our marriage, what career decision we should make, or how to defend our political choices, and so on. And while many of those things are addressed at various points in the scripture, that is not the point of the Bible as a whole. And if we read it that way, we will very quickly walk away disappointed and frustrated. 
The Bible is not a collection of meme-worthy or pithy statements that we can post on our Facebook or Instagram feed in order to make it like, look like we're a serious follower of Jesus. No, the Bible is a literary work that requires time and exposure a lot like a marinade. I heard one pastor say it this way. The Bible is the kind of literature that one reads for a lifetime without exhausting the layered riches within. If this is true, and we are supposed to spend a lifetime reading this text, then the Bible has a very different standard of success than many of us do. If you're taking notes, this should be on the sheet in front of you. It says, the Bible is far more concerned with the way that we understand each piece, not only in its immediate context, but in how it fits in the overall narrative that leads to Jesus as well as to our spiritual formation. As you grow in your reading, you will begin to discover new riches in the bottomless depths that Scripture has to offer, which means at some point you will find yourself delighting even in those things like the genealogy of Esau or these random stories or obscure texts. You're like, I don't even know what that means. Because as we do this, we begin to know God more deeply and more intimately. This is the invitation by God in Psalm 1. An invitation to understand that the Bible is not just a story, but is a story meant to change our mind and mold our perception on what is right, what is wrong, how to think, how to talk, how to live, how to treat other people, how to deal with money or our sexuality, and how to deal with everything that more often than not we try to avoid because it is uncomfortable. It's an invitation to become like a tree planted by streams of water, to delight in and marinate on the scriptures, and to become a tree that yields its fruit in season and have leaves that do not wither, but has success in all that we do. This is the invitation, and I would even say the promise of the Lectio Divina. It's the same promise that God gives us in Jeremiah 13 when he says this. Those who seek me find me when they seek me with all their heart. So this week, here's what I want you to do. I want you to spend, find a time. Just spend that time retreating. Get away. Then choose a story or a chapter. Once again, you can use what we are using as a church or you can use, find another chapter or something like that. But, but find a chapter and read through it slowly. Then reflect on it. Marinate in what the text is trying to tell you. Respond with things that seem to jump off the page or roll around in your mind. And then rest. Rest in the presence of God who is with you in that 